Okay, so yes, welcome to the sixth night of our 14 days of Penmus. Um, I think for those of you who have joined us on some of the others, I think it's been uh, really interesting so far. And I don't think tonight will be an exception. It's, um, we still have um, several uh, more talks coming up over the next few days. And I specifically wanted to mention next Monday, um, which is actually our party, which is going to be um, just very relaxed and bring a mince pie and a, and a glass of old wine. But we are going to be stepping up the gift giving during that. Um, there was also a suggestion, which I'll pop a little post in group as well, that for anybody who hasn't opened their secret Santas from group, it might be quite nice for us to do that during um, Monday night's festivities. Um, and if you're after one of the Rob, Robert Oster inks, obviously whilst we're giving them away every night, we will be, uh, there will be several being given away during that event. So um, tonight's sponsor is Incredible Pens, which is the lovely Hayes. And tonight we are, um, they're giving away a Schaefer Targa. Ah. So that's the main prize. And of course, there'll be a bottle of uh, Robert Oster ink as well. Um, Hayes is going to try and keep up with the messages, but if you have got any burning questions, I'm sure she won't mind you un unmuting yourself and asking if she misses something. So um, Hayes is a 24-year-old of incredible pens, a vintage pen reselling and refurbishing business that they began in early 2021. They became obsessed with fountain pens at the age of nine after their grandfather gifted them a set of PenQuest pens with turquoise ink and have never looked back. They got into vintage pens and pen ID somewhat by accident after their father, who was also in the, in the group this evening, uh, encouraged them to buy an eBay listing with five unidentified Waterman pens for £25. The journey taken to identify those pens by the poorly lit photographs on eBay started a year-long obsession to learn everything they could about pre-1990s fountain pens to the point where they are now compiling notes to begin Pencyclopedia, trademarked. <laughs> We're recording and everything. So there we go. So I will now ha hand over to Hayes. And uh, hello. Go. hello, hello. Right. Um, yeah, um, George has just put a lovely tip in the chat. If you do have a question for me, please either preface it with a little question mark uh, thing. So if I'm scanning the chat, I can find them uh, more easily. Or if you want to ask a question aloud, there is a little feature in the reaction where you can do a little raise hand emoji and your face should pop up with a raised hand for me so I can see that you have a question to ask. If I don't get to it in like two, three minutes, feel free to just unmute and ask me something. Um, but I'm gonna have a little PowerPoint presentation for everybody. Um, so, because of course you can't really ID pens if you can't see them. Um, an issue that I have yet to impress into the minds of eBay listers. <laughs> so uh, I will share my screen quickly and uh, Away we go. There you go. Can you all see my screen currently in this presentation? Brilliant. Okie dokie. Um, so uh, welcome everybody to my penless talk. Um, as Steph so lovely introduced me, uh, I am Hayes um, and I run Incredible Pens. Um, and uh, today I'm going to be telling you all about identifying vintage pens. Um, so I've been doing this for a year which isn't very long um but i have become deeply obsessed with this as a subject and it has become pretty much my favorite thing to nerd out about to all of my friends uh so hopefully i can impress some things uh to uh to help you all a um, little bit about me as steph just introduced i run incredible pens it's a i'm hoping that i'm not also sharing the little camera interface and you can just see the presentation um but uh that that is my my lovely logo um i buy up um 
unloved, disused, unidentified, sometimes broken fountain pens from boot fairs, eBay's, um, house clearances, uh, refurbish them and um, get them ready to resell onto pen lovers like yourselves. And uh, here is a picture of the two Pencrest pens. Um, these are actually replacements because my original ones got stolen. So part of my pen, uh, my vintage pen identification journey has been finding replacements for these online and working out how to do that. So that I will cover a little bit about that in this talk. Um, to lay out expectations for this evening, this is probably not going to be a deep dive into the really unique, uh, you know, one of one vintage pens, the prototypes in 1910s, you know, original Waterman's. This is going to be the kind of vintage pens that you're most likely to come across in the kind of situations where you might need to identify them. If you've got your nose pressed up against the glass in a, a really dimly lit charity shop, or if you are, um, you know, scrolling through eBay and you come across a listing and it's ending in five minutes and the photos were taken down the wrong end of a telescope at night. Um, you know, how do you find out what these pens are and whether they're worth the money you're going to pay for them? Um, I am running on a basis of zero background on the chair. So, you know, I'm assuming you know what a fountain pen is and that's about it. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to run through some basics um, relatively quickly. If people do have any questions, feel free to stop me. Um, and uh, I will then get on to some of the more interesting stuff. Uh, simple identification leading into the more complicated identification, the places that you can go to find reliable information, and some Google foo uh, for when you have a pen in your hand and you want to take a look at it and work out what on earth it is. Um, because a lot of people have never been taught how to really optimize their Google searches for that. And that's the thing that can make it really hard to identify a pen. If you've had a, a grandparent pass away and they've left you a beautiful thing and you have no idea what it is, if you don't know how to optimize your searches, it's going to be really hard to find out. And that's where people like me come in. I will also be taking identification requests. So if people have pens and they don't know what they are, um, they can either show them on the camera or even better, if they can take a picture of them and send them to me on Facebook, I will be happy to do that towards the end of the talk. So, uh, yeah, hopefully that's all good. Um, I've just realised I have not made myself the spotlight person, so I can, I, I'm showing you the screen anyway. So, basics of pen identification. You're going to need to know some basic terminology if you're wanting to look up and work out what the pen it is that you have is. So this is a basic Parker Vector. Really, really simple, made of plastic, really cheap. You can get them for a tenner. I have a couple in my pen bag currently. Um, but for the purposes of today, I'm hoping you can all see my cursor. Brilliant. So you've got the clip. Up here at the top is the finial. You've got the cap of the pen. You've got, this is the cap band, the barrel, the section, and the nib. You've also got the feed in there. And uh, you will also sometimes have what's called a tassie. That's currently not visible because it is underneath where the pen is posted. So um, those are all things that you're going to find very, very useful in identifying your pens. And specifically, search terms when you're searching things. Um, the amount of times I've tracked down a pen by searching pen with gold triangular tassie and it's like one like forum post, like, hey, I've got this pen. And someone's like, it's got a gold tassy. So it's this from 1923. Um, so very, very useful to be able to know these terms and, um, and have them just completely at your beck and call. Um, I find that a lot of people get them muddled up and they'll refer to like the section as the barrel and things like that. Having them the right way around can be really, really useful for when you're doing Google searching to do internet research to identify your pens. Um, you don't have to do everything online. There is also a wide array of books and DVDs and things available. This is one I actually purchased from uh, from the group recently on collectible fountain pens. It is beautiful. There's some gorgeous things in there. Um, but they are really, really useful as well for identifying pens if you've got something more unique. Um, specifically, the kind of things that are going to be really, really useful for ID as well are if you can I'm talking very quickly, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, having the measurement of the pen as well. So you want the measurement of it capped, you want the measurement uncapped, and you'll want the measurement posted. And those can be really useful for telling apart two similar models. So for example, there was a thing in the group the other day of somebody saying that they had a pen and um, 
they weren't sure what it was because it was a lot shorter than they expected. And that immediately clued me in that it was actually a very similar model, but was not the same pen that they thought it was because it was so much shorter and Parker did about 20 models that looked the same, but only differed by length. <laughs> because of course, why not? Why wouldn't you do that? <laughs> um, the other thing that's gonna be really helpful is knowing some terms for the shapes of the pen. So this is a really standard cylindrical, cylindrical pen, um, but you also get pens that are cigar shaped. Um, so I've got one of them in a future picture. Um, you can have pens that are significantly fatter around this midpoint here. Um, being able to know like, hey, it's, it's, um, it, it's got a really fat section and things like that, or it's got a cigar shaped barrel. That's again, gonna be very useful if you've got a pen in your hands and you want to know what it is and you're making Google searches. So useful baseline knowledge. This is stuff that pretty much everyone here I'm expecting you'll know anyway. Um, but the kind of things that if you are, again, looking at those really blurry photographs on eBay, uh, if you are squinting in a charity shop, you're going to spot straight away to give you an idea that the pen you're looking at is from a decent and reputable brand. Um, so Parker, pretty standard one that everybody knows. They all have, or not all of them, most of them, have these beautiful arrow clips. And they're going to look quite different pen to pen. So this is my 180. And this one here is a classic. So you can see it's got the dimple at the top, which will differentiate them. People often get these two modeled up because they're quite similar, but they actually have very different cap finials and quite different clips. And also their nibs are different. So, this is one of the things that when you are spending a lot of time identifying pens from pictures, um, having that knowledge to hand is quite useful. Waterman pens. Waterman like writing their name on their pens. It makes it really easy to know if you've got a Waterman pen in your hands. Um, so this one, the liaison that I was showing off just before the call started, has a W right on the cap finial there. Um, it says Waterman Paris along the side. And uh, this one, which is the Waterman Hemisphere, has a W right on the top of the clip. And they both also say Waterman on the nib. I'm not sure if you can see that, but we've got the logo and it says Waterman right on the nib there. Um, so if you've got a Waterman pen, usually it will just say that on it. The older ones, the 1920s hard rubber ones, say Waterman's apostrophe S. Uh, engraved on the side of the hard rubber, and they also will usually say that on the nib, unless it's the really er early ones which said warranted, um, because that was the nib company that made the nibs. Um, other really common things that you'll find, um, Schaefer pens, the white dot is usually a really, really good indicator that you're holding a Schaefer, and if you find a pen that has a snow cap on the top of it, and you can afford it, it's fake. Um, but if you, if you can't afford it, it's a Mont Blanc. <laughs> um, that's at least my rule anyway. <laughs> um, so having these kind of things just embedded in your head um, are very, very useful tools to have when you're identifying on the fly. If, however, you're studying a pen in your hands directly, you're probably going to want to be delving more in depth into getting the exact model and type. The pens I'm looking at today to set expectations, again, I'm not looking at the very, very early ones. They were all hard rubber cylinders or ebonite cylinders with a cap that was just a triangle with a blob with the name of the pen company written on the side and on the nib. Um, there are significant differences between them. The nibs were different. The, the, the shapes and sizes were slightly different. The, the grip was slightly different. But they all look very, very similar. And for a beginner's guide to identifying pens, that's not a good place to start. So we're going to be looking at pens that are officially vintage, so before 2001, because vintage begins 20 years ago. Yes, that makes even me, even me feel old. I'm, I'm, I, I'm officially vintage. <laughs> um, and uh, you are, are probably not going to be seeing much before 1928. Uh, so you've got sort of that. Um, 80 year span that we're probably going to be looking at in terms of pens today, just because they are significantly easier to find the traits for, for identification. Um, again, if anybody has anything they want to ask, please, please don't hesitate to stop me. I noticed there are some chat notifications, which I'm just going to check very, very quickly. 
Um, do, do, do. Yep, that's the, the, the I, I remember that I got shows so that the speaker camera was in the corner uh, at the last minute, but I, I did not remember until just now. Thank you. Um, Yeah, 20 years ago, 20 years ago is when vintage starts. I know, I don't, I don't like that either, but it is, it is the official guidance. Or at least certainly it's what I've been told over and over again. Um, so anything pre-2001, that actually means that this pen here, which I was given when I was 11 years old, it's the Waterman Hemisphere, which you can tell by the sloped cap finial there, the sort of teardrop shaped clip and the bat in the middle barrel. Um, yeah, Rachel's got one there as well. They're beautiful, beautiful pens. One of my favourite ones, currently filled with uh, diamond gold and sands. This one. Um, this is technically vintage because these were designed in 1992. So they are uh, beautiful things, but they're modern pens that are still sold. It's just that the design is considered to be vintage, um, which boggles my mind a little bit. But there we go. Um, where to look? So there are a whole load of various other pen enthusiasts, as it were, who have made little pen encyclopedias dedicated to specific brands, specific eras, um, specific groups of manufacturers, even sometimes just arguments between manufacturers. I found whole blogs dedicated to um, the fight between Parker and um, Bit and uh, Biro when the original Biro was patented and Rollerballs came out. Um, so there's all sorts of interesting things that you can find online. When it comes to pen identification, for Parker's there is one gold standard site. Anybody who's done pen identification before will know it. It is parkerpens.net. It is run by a fantastic guy. His name's Tony. Um, he updates relatively regularly. I think his last update was at the end of 2020. Um, I don't know if he's in the group. I don't know much about the guy at all. Um, but he has this brilliant comprehensive website with almost every Parker pen they've ever made, uh, listed and disambiguated. I'm hoping I pronounced that right. Um, so that you can tell them apart from one another and even has a what pen do I have page where you can scroll through a photograph of every single Parker pen he's managed to find to work out which one's your, one yours is. It's brilliant. It is one of the best resources I have ever had to use. And I can highly recommend that as a reputable site. It's not always right and it's not always perfect. It doesn't have every single pen. You will always find some exceptions, but it's got pretty much every common pen and it's got a huge selection of images of the very unusual lucky curve pens, including some of the gold filigrees and all that kind of really fancy luxurious stuff that you want to just get your hands on in a museum. Um, so parkerpens.net, beautifully reputable source. Um, Raven's March, little known resource, but an absolute gold mine for information on early Waterman and Schaefer. Um, when I was struggling to identify those five Waterman pens uh, that dad suggested that I buy way back December last year. Yeah, full year ago now. Um, those pens, uh, I managed to identify the last couple of those using ravensmarch.com. Um, I'm going to post links to all of these in a comment uh, when the video is uh, is posted by Andrew. So I, I will have links to all these sites there at that point, and I can also put them in the chat. Um, I'm just going to have a sip of my drink quickly. There we go. Um, so definitely a site I recommend there. It's got a little academic notice saying not to cite it as a source, but I'm going to anyway, <laughs> because it's really good. Um, I've never had any issues there. And also uh, the person who runs the site regularly updates it and you can email him with new information and photographs if you have any. Um, just a really useful place to collect information about Waterman Schaefer and uh, some, some Parker. Um, the other places that I tend to look, there's a, there's, places like, there's a place called Captain Chang's, um, there's um, Pen Corner, Pen Collect, there's, there's loads of, there's, there's the Fountain Pen Forums, Fountain Pens, um, yeah, 
just loads and loads of places that you can go and look online anywhere that pen nerds and i would classify people identifying vintage fountain pens as probably being pen nerds um anywhere we gather you will find relatively credible sources of information um the places that i would recommend that you don't look as i click through my powerpoint what not to trust immediately if you're holding a pen and it's in a box do not immediately believe that the pen inside of that box has anything to do with the box it's in the amount of times i've seen cross pens in shaper boxes or waterman boxes that contain just like paper chase pens um they're not connected together with ball and chain um, which means that you cannot immediately trust that the pen that you're holding comes from its box. If there's paperwork in there, I mean, look through the paperwork, see if the pens in the paperwork looks like the one you're holding. But I've had several pens that have turned up with completely unrelated paperwork, unrelated receipts. Um, I found one Waterman pen that had a receipt for a Waterman hemisphere in there, but the box was one of these ones with the yellow insides which debuted significantly a long time before the hemisphere was made and um, because they were for the centennial of um waterman which was in the 1980s um so you cannot always trust the box that you're holding or the receipt or the paperwork it comes with to identify the pen um the other things that you can't trust ebay listings if you come across a pen, you've done a reverse image search, you come across an eBay listing and it says, Waterman, foreign atrium. This is a, a real case that happened to me. And you look at that pen. Check other sources before you believe that that person has identified that pen correctly. The amount of Waterman Paris I have come across where somebody has listed the pen as just being a, a Waterman Paris. And I'm sitting there going, that is where they are made. That is not a maker pen. That is, that is where they are made. I understand the confusion. It does say it right in the box. Waterman Paris. So it's really easy to think, hey, I'm holding a Waterman Paris, but that is not the pen you're holding in all likelihood. Um, I'm just gonna check what these lovely chat messages are quickly before I move on. Um, I firmly agree with Roz. Vintage Shapers are an absolute pain to ID. Um, yeah, penhero.com is another one that I found really, really uh, useful information on. I would again agree there. And information on Pelican pens, I have struggled. Genuinely, I have really struggled with that one. For some reason, they're just not well documented. It's possible I just haven't stumbled across the right source yet. Um, I do have one in my bookmarks that has uh, some information on Pelican pens, but as of yet, I have yet to find a reliable, consistent and credible source for information identifying the vintage ones. Most of them come with the model numbers that I've seen so far, but I've actually not come across any in my eBay bidding yet that were not pre-identified, refurbished already and therefore not particularly my business um, as it's happened. Um, oh, thank you both Edmund and Gary. Um, I will have I will write that down and have a look at the Pelican's perch because I will add that to my sources list. I'm always enjoying. This is one of the other things I would definitely say to trust other fountain pen nerds and their collections of knowledge on these things. Um, so uh, I firmly agree that if anyone here is recommending a site, they likely know what they're talking about. Um, Pelican's perch. Now, in terms of pens that are awkward to identify um yeah sh shapertarga.com is fantastic for identifying shapers um i have used them a, a lot of times to identify which specific variety of lady shaper i'm holding because i have about five currently sitting in my processing boxes waiting for replacement point stylo nibs um which are a, again a pain to get hold of um but well, I'll get them eventually. It's just I've got to find a reliable source. This is always going to be the problem with identifying older pens, reliable sources. Um, it's really, really hard sometimes to track the provenance of the information that you're getting. And so sometimes it will just be a random person on a blog who says, Chinny reckon this, and then it becomes the, the information that's available. And it's just not true. Um, there was a big thing about there being um, purple diamond 
clips for Parker Vacumatics. There are blue diamond clips and you can get ones with white and red as well. Um, but I've never seen a non-photoshopped example of a purple diamond on a Vacumatic clip. I will get back to that. I've gone into my deep, deep nerd law. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for that site recommendation. I have written it down. Um, the other company that I find is a pain due to shaky records uh, to identify the pens for is Waterman. They had companies incorporated in three different countries. So they would have pens that released that were the same pen under two or three different names um, in the different countries for different prices, completely the same pen, same body, same screw thread. You could take two pieces from these two different pens and put them together and they would fit and they would work and they would look the same, but they were called two different things. It boggles the mind. And they also have yet to reply to the email that I sent asking if they had any of their older catalogs. So um, it can sometimes be a pain getting hold of this information. But we're going to start with Parker because Parker are easy to get information for. They are the gold standard for finding information for pens. So there's still going to be some you struggle with, but they are really, really good and identifiable due to this little feature here. Since the 1930s, almost every single pen that Parker have produced have had the arrow motif on, with the exception of a handful of duofolds, the big reds, and a couple of other limited pens that they've done. But this arrow clip motif, you will usually find on a Parker pen. So if you're looking at a pen and it has that, and it's not a fake, and I'll come to that, you are probably holding a Parker pen. Um, examples of companies ripping off the arrow clip though are abundant. For example, this is a pen I got off AliExpress. And as you can see, that is a standard arrow clip. It's actually quite a nice pen and it was £1.50 but um, it is ripping off Parker, that is, I believe, a Bauer. Um, so you do have to be careful still, doesn't guarantee anything, but it is a good point. If you can find a pen that has the arrow clip and it looks like another Parker model that you've been able to identify, odds on, you've got a real pen. Um, so, as I said, the arrow clip, this is the archetype. This here, this image here, if I, I'll move my little camera window. Uh, this here is exactly why the clip is so important with Parker ID. These two pens look darn nearly identical, but they are two different makes, technically. Um, you have the top one, which is the Parker Arrow, and the bottom one, which is the Parker 95. And as you can see, there's a tiny difference in the finial. The main difference is that the clip has fletching here, and it does not have fletching here. So really, really getting in and having a really good look at what the clip is when you're holding a Parker pen can tell you everything. Here is, as I mentioned, the blue diamond clip on a Vacumatic. This is a, a Flyter Vacumatic from uh, the 1940s, I believe. Um, as you, it's got the, the plain uh, sort of finial gem that they have they had and the blue diamond. It's not, it's gonna be late 1930s if it's got the blue diamond. Um, but yeah, it's a, a the beautiful, beautiful pens. Um, the clip makes, makes or breaks it when it comes to Parker pens. So they're going to be different, sometimes even between pens of the same model. Parker 51 had seven different types of arrow clip, but they were all this rough shape. Um, only the first few vacuumatics had this, and then they changed into different clip, into different lengths and fletchings. Um, yeah, Parkers do absolutely overlap model parts, um, as Ross said. So um, you can't always tell everything just by looking at the clip. It's You have to take everything as a whole. So that's why getting the pen part names down and something that you can just throw out there straight away is very, very important. Um, if I was popping into a Google search, I had a um, tapered cylindrical pen. It was black with gold trim and it had a fletched arrow clip, I would likely get a turn back that I had a Parker 95 in my hands, for example. Although there would probably be some people who misidentified it as a Parker arrow. <laughs> um, you've often got differences within, the 50 ones are the ones where I'm, I'm sort of sitting there going, you had a really set shape to them and then the last few that you released looked different and had a different end. They weren't a straight round cigar shape why um 
but yeah, that's that's that is Parker Penn's. Um, the exceptions to the rule, of course, are the ones that did not come with an arrow clip. So this is an array of original geofolds, um, and uh, you can see there it says geofold on the uh, the red hard rubber there. Um, these are beautiful, beautiful pens. These ones were designed by um, Valentine, a designer called Valentine, and they are they are lovely, George Valentine, I believe. Um, really, really pretty pens. But they don't have the arrow clip. Instead, they say Parker stamped down at the top of this round top whip. So you can't tell everything just by the arrow. Um, the other exceptions with Parker are that they often have pens that look really, really similar to one another. So the Lady 17, for example, has a 45 clip and finial. I'll take a picture of that and hold one up here um, and show you the difference. Because of course I have them to hand, why wouldn't I? Um, I'm not a nerd, everyone else is a nerd. <laughs> so the 45 has this very, very straight fletching at the top here. Do that uh, on the arrow clip. And it has this very squared off finial. Um, with the indent at the top. And the Lady 17, upon first examination to people, usually gets mistaken for a 51 because it has this little nib. But they're actually really, really short. This is only about 12 centimeters long. And they have this 45 clip, especially this one, which is a, um, it's, it's got this gold 45 clip. I think it's the Lady 17 Deluxe. No, it doesn't have the thick band. It could still be a deluxe. The, the super has the thick band. Anyway, they are um, very, very pretty. And even if you're a real nerd about these things, you're still probably going to need to refer to the notes every so often, which I do on a regular basis. There's a reason I have all these ID sets bookmarked. I'll be like, I'm pretty sure I know what this pen is, but I'll check. And that's absolutely a habit you should always be in if this is something that you want to be doing regularly. Never rely on your memory because one day you'll get your wires crossed and you'll get something really wrong. Um, this pen is also the source of a huge amount of confusion when it comes to Parker pens because it's basically an amalgamation of four different models of pen. Um, so it's got the, um, it, it looks a lot like a Junior Slimfold in a lot of cases. It's got the 45 clip, it's got the, the 51 um, section, and it's got the filling system that looks a lot like some of the 51s and a lot of the 45s, but it's shorter, so it confuses everyone. Um, so if you come across a pen that confuses you a lot, try not to look at it as a Franken pen, try seeing if there are other pens that used the same model parts. Um, Ros made a very astute observation, which was that they, Parker were notorious for doing this. If they had a good thing going, they just kept it going. Um, an example, and again, an, an example of an exception when it came to Parker are these, which are the 25s. As you can see, it has this little square clip here, and I haven't, I haven't uh, refinished this one yet. But if you look closely, it has a tiny arrow motif printed on to the square. So it does have the arrow motif, but it's not immediately visible. And it's also very identifiable due to this step down at the bottom of the barrel. Um, so, there are always other ways to identify these pens. Um, I always recommend looking at the simple things first and moving on from them once you have um, got relatively sure of what you're holding on to. Yeah, the 25s absolutely are uh, cult classics. I've seen a lot of love for them. You can get ones that are green or orange rather than this one, which is a blue one. Um, so as you can see in there, the grip is a navy blue. Um, you can get ones that are green or orange. They're incredibly rare, very highly sought after. And anytime they turn up for auction, they go for five, six, seven times the standard price of 25. And there are several people in the group who have them and I am envious. Oh, yes, and the white ones as well. Um, thank you, you're, you're helping my talk a lot here. <laughs> um, yeah, the black and the black matte bodies and the, they did lots and lots of varieties of them. It's just the green and the orange ones are the ones that people go completely nuts over. I've seen the green ones go for north of 120 quid, which considering the standard 25s go for about 30 <laughs> is a lot. Um, 
So moving on from Parker, we are going to have a look at Waterman. Um, now, the era that I tend to find the, uh, the most interesting when it comes to Waterman pens are either the 1920s hard rubber ones with their really soft, flexible gold nibs, or the 60s and 70s when they started ramping back up after the massive drop in fountain pens due to um, ballpoints becoming a thing in the uh, late 50s. Um, so here we have the Waterman CF. This is my background image here. It's really identifiable due to this interesting nib shaping and the shape of the clip, which I will get onto. Um, yes, Waterman's are my absolute favorite. I have loads of them as stated. I got this beautiful hemisphere. This is in a limited edition color called Shimmering Light Blue. I don't think dad knew that when he got me. Ooh, yes, that's a laureate, isn't it, Rachel? Yeah, it's, they're, they're gorgeous. Um, I've got the liaison I was showing off earlier. This is an unusual pen. I, you don't see many of these. I think they only made them for five years and they are like their high-end executive range and they're beautiful and they've got these glorious two-tone nibs. Um, I'm in love with Waterman. I will rep Waterman till the day I die. Um, they really like shoving their names on the things that they sell. So normally you might not be able to know which model because they get very confused and they didn't keep much documentation when they were moving between companies and selling who owned them and they became Waterman Paris instead of Watermans. Um, but you will at least know that you're holding a Waterman because it will probably say it in like four different places. Um, so as stated before, this one has it on the cap for Neil, it has it on the side there, it has it has it on the nib, this one has it on the clip, uh, the cap and the nib as well. Um, this is a nib from a Le Mans, I believe, when they did their launch of the Le Mans pens uh, with their uh, centennial um, in 1980, oh, 1984, that was it, 1984. Um, and this here is the um, CF, which means cartridge filled as I suddenly lose all of my brain cells all at once. Um, and they are glorious. And they don't actually, other than sometimes on the edge of the cap band, say the name on them, which means that this is one of the pens that you only sometimes find identified, but it's also one of the pens that they made the most of because this was their big push um, to really try and corner the market. Uh, with cartridge filling pens and it was it was named the CF because it was a cartridge filler and that was a relatively new thing to do at the time. Um, they originally came with paper cartridges I think but they, 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 were, they, they were these weird little interesting they were weird they were unusual cartridges the first cartridge filling ones they, they, they used and uh, they only moved on to the disposable plastic after a little while from what I'm aware of. Um, although again, this is a sort this is a matter of sourcing. So uh, I read that once and I am half remembering it. Um, so don't don't rely on just one source of information. Always check back and forth. Glass, thank you, George. I knew I knew they were weird. Um, uh, I'm just gonna go through some questions that have turned up here. Um, Callie. Um, if you've never tried a Waterman, I would recommend if you're looking for vintage, it depends what you're looking for in a pen. Um, if you want a whole load of uh, like flex to your pen, I would say go for one of the earlier ones, the 1920s, 30s Watermans. You get these nice soft gold nibs. They have some nice like gentle flex to them. They're gorgeous to write with. Um, they are not always the prettiest things externally, although they can be. It depends on your taste. Um, but they are not too hard to come by, usually relatively easy to refurbish. Lots of them are lever fillers, which means they've got sacks inside, so you have to get those replaced first. Um, if you're looking for something a bit more easy to use, I'd probably recommend going for one of the CFs. Um, they are really nice, really pretty, relatively easy to get hold of on eBay and so ubiquitous. And uh, you can pick them up for about if you're going on eBay, if you don't care that you're going to have to clean it first, about 45 quid and they will last you forever. They're beautiful to hold. I've got one of their pencils here, I believe, in the CF range, not that one. 
I've got so many pens. Um, no, I'll find it eventually. There, they, there it is. So I've got one of the pencils here. They are absolutely gorgeous little things. They're quite narrow. Um, so if you've got smaller hands, they're great. And um, they come in matching sets with the propelling pencils, which are absolutely beautiful to use as well. So um, I'd highly recommend a CF if you're going for a more reliable writing experience and you're not looking for lots and lots of flex. Um, um, yeah, Ros, Ros has some recommendations there too. If you're going for something really snazzy, go for an Edison. They're expensive, they're beautiful, they're a grail pen of mine, they're gorgeous. They've got these inlaid nibs, fantastic things. Um, you've got um, the exceptions, you've got the exclusives, you've got all kinds, they're just, they did so many really nice pens in the 60s and 70s and early 80s and I could talk about them for years and again they've got so little documentation on the models which makes it really hard to track down accurate information about their manufacture, um, it drives me absolutely bonkers. Um, and yes, Laureates, they're reliable, they're consistent, they're cheap, they're easy to get hold of. I say cheap, but they're, they're um, a mid rate. They're not like buying a, a Jin Hao or Valley Express cheap. They are, they are cheap for a vintage fountain pen compared to the things like the Edsons. Um, and um, yes, the Supermaster is also beautiful. Um, I recently got hold of one of those. I also managed to get hold of one of the, this, this is something I'm quite excited about, but I need to get a replacement part for it. It's the Waterman Laureate, but it's in the silver filled, um, oh, the word has escaped me. It's, it's got lots of little tiny trenches in the silver and, and the word has completely set my mind for the description of that. I've got it written down attached to the pen. Um, they're beautiful and they're wonderful and it's got a gold nib and it's a gorgeous thing and I'm absolutely in love with it and it's sterling silver and I cannot wait to get the replacement part. Um, I'd also recommend if you're going for something absolutely gorgeous but very expensive and hard to get hold of, uh, the Lady Patricia. They're gorgeous. They're so nice, the onyx finishing on it. Um, beautiful, beautiful thing. I lost an eBay auction for one by absolute miles a couple of months back because uh, it was listed starting at 99 pence and it built up to about 300 by the time it finally sold. Um, stunning. Um, Jackie, you think you've got, if you can uh, sort of clarify what it is that you think you have, um, Jackie, I can probably identify it for you towards the end of the talk, um, but they are absolutely lovely. Um, yeah. Um, and I would agree definitely with George there. If you're looking for CFs, do make sure you have a spare cartridge to refill or a working converter um, because they take converters and it makes life a lot easier. If you do not have to consistently fill up one of the old cartridges, <laughs> they are kind of hard to come by. Um, yeah. Uh, Jackie, I'm not sure if you've tried to upload an image or something, but if you have, I haven't been able to see it. Um, if you can hold it up to the camera, I will see if I can find you. I say I don't, I don't know, um, <laughs> I, I don't know how to upload an image, but uh, I'm trying to because I've got a background on, so I'm not quite sure. Oh, yeah, I'm yeah. hoping I'm seeing that right. Um, it's got a sort of hexagon. One, yes. two, three, four. Hexagon and and it's um so it's eighteen carat gold on the on the nib. Oh, that's lovely. Well, my husband um, doesn't like it. <laughs> no, he doesn't. He barely uses it. Um, but I think maybe the nib was never perfect from the. I I didn't buy it. It's something he's had a long while, and it comes as a set. There's a pencil, um, biro and fountain pen. Oh no, I recognise um, it and I'd need to go and check my um, notes and encyclopedia because I, 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 I'm I sitting here going, oh, I know that pen. It's not the, the uh, Le Mans 200 or something, is it? It's, it's um, no, it's not. I can, I can, um, if private you can, me I can take some photos and private message ones would be, I can, I can do that later with, um, I'll put it by a, a measuring stick and then you'll, 
see its length as well. That would be brilliant. Um, so, but it's a bit the worse for wear because he sort of leaves things rattling around in his pocket. <laughs> but anyway, I'll send yeah. that later. Thank you. That would be brilliant. And I can ID that for you later today. I, I recognise the pen. I, the part of my brain that has seen it before and ID'd one of those pens because I've bought one is rattling around and they're going, I've seen this, but it won't tell me the name. So I will get that to you later on today. Jackie? Can you show it again, please, Jackie? Okay, we'll do. I think it's not helped by the fact that I've got this weird uh, background on. So it's um, uh, it's not always picking. I'm trying to get it where the camera is. There we go. Yes, because it's got there that central go. dot. Um, oh, for goodness sake. Just it keeps breaking in and out because it's not picking it up that it's part of me. Hold it vertically, Jackie, in front of your face. That's it. The camera will pick it up. <laughs> I'll get my face right in. You'll be able to see how, okay. how, how long my nose hair is. There you go. Is that any help? Yeah, I can definitely see that. Oh, um, do you want to see the nib? This is one of the things that's absolutely in my notes, but I can't access my notes until I'm finished with the presentation. So as yeah, soon as I'm finished with the presentation, I should be able to get you a name there. Um, yeah, that's, that's the... I put in front of my face, he goes, right, there you go. I don't know if that's any, that's probably bleaching out now, sorry. I'll send you some pictures, that'll that'll be more. And it, it, I mean, it just got Waterman written all over it, like you say. I'm just checking the chat. No, I think you're absolutely spot on. Um, oh, is it? Fancy that. <laughs> yeah, yep, yeah, I think so. Um, just on a quick Google, yes. Um, yeah, so that's a, that's a, I can't pronounce the French, I do apologise, I, I speak Spanish, I speak German, I do not speak French, um, but um, the uh, Le, Tal Le Talon, I can't, I can't say it, I'm sorry. Le Talon, uh, I would imagine. Yes. Yeah, Le Talon, that's perfect, Hayes. Yeah. Um, one day I will learn French. <laughs> Today is not that day. Um, the other thing you'll see very commonly with Waterman pens, especially earlier ones, is this sort of stepped in Art Deco clip with the lining along the top. This is a W5. Um, you also see this on a lot of their earlier sort of W range pens. Um, they are really quite nice. Um, they came with, with gold nibs as standard, this gold cap banding. Beautiful. I think they were um, celluloid bodies. Um, just really, really nice pens. Um, to get hold of, and I've got a couple of them rattling around. I've got a Dauntless, which has a very similar clip. Uh, that's one of the ones that had two different names in different countries. Um, it was a, a, a Dauntless and uh, something else that, that meant Dauntless. Um, two different names, uh, same, same model. Uh, just one was the American and one was the Canadian one. Why? Who knows? Uh, but yeah, Waterman love writing their name on things. If you're holding a Waterman, it will probably tell you. It's 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 like a like, like someone who's gluten free. You know, actually, I'm gluten free. I'm gluten free. Um, you know, it'll tell you. Uh, so you don't have to find that one out. What's what's tricky is finding out which model that you have. Um, and that was a wonderful little distraction there, uh, as we all got very excited about Waterman pens because they are beautiful. Um. As stated, there are some difficulties with Waterman pens. They they don't like uh, being identified often. I found there's a website called Captain Chang's uh, that has a remarkable amount of detail about just a handful of the pens that are harder to identify, which is really quite useful separating things like the pro graduate from the graduate and um, finding information about the Daytona, which in one country, there was a pen called a pro-graduate. It was in America, there was a pen called a pro-graduate. Pro Over here, there was a pen called the Daytona. Um, and there was a different pen called the pro-graduate. So very irritating sometimes to identify these things. I've sold a couple of Daytonas and they're very, very nice to use, have really nice, um, like smooth and slightly toothy seal nibs they're really lovely but yeah uh, it can be a pain when you're trying to identify waterman pens so that's one of the ones that i would recommend you go and you do further research with um it's there's lots and lots of websites that have partial information on as i said raven smart pens 
uh, just a fantastic resource for these sorts of things. Um, and there are things like Pen Collect has lots of information on Waterman's. I've used that before. Um, you can also sometimes find quite accurate information from auction sites, but I don't trust that off the back of things because frequently auction houses are terrible at identifying the pens they have in their possession and they get it wildly wrong. And then I'm sitting there going, that's not, that's not a Waterman CF. That's, it's a W5, it looks completely different. How have you got it this wrong? Um, 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 wonderful. So yeah, um, there are all sorts of other pens that you can identify across are very identifiable due to the shape of their clip. Um, they have a very distinct clip shape that they use. Um, and they also tend to do sort of a pointed um, torpedo shape pen. Um, you also can find Shaper, obviously the white dot is archetypal. Um, not every Shaper has a white dot, but if it has a white dot, it's probably a Shaper. Um, not all squares are rectangles, <laughs> but, but, but yeah. Nuzzle squares are, are rectangles, but all rectangles. No, I've got that backwards. I'm sorry. I'm tired. Um, <laughs> not all rectangles are squares. All squares are rectangles. I give up. Um, anyway, yeah, you're you're going to find quite a lot of pens that are weird looking, and that um, don't quite fit any of the things that you would normally expect. Um, it's at that point that I start recommending you use what I, I affectionately refer to as Google Foo, um, basically Boolean searches on Google. So my school, I went to a relatively good school, but in like a three year span, they offered these IT classes where they would teach you how to really optimize Google searches. And then the year above mine, they didn't do that. And then they stopped doing it after three years. So three years below me didn't get that. They were just assumed to have that knowledge innately. Um, certainly my younger sister never did. And she's, she's seven years my junior and she really, really struggles with good Google searching. So I would recommend uh, learning a little bit about Boolean searches for here and now. I'll explain some of that. Um, if you are trying to find a specific pen you're holding it in your hands and you can identify you know the shape of the barrel so it's a cigar shape it's got a gold cap it's it's 18 carat filled it's got a specific clip shape typing all of that into google you're gonna it's going to try and search for that entire thing as a string or each individual word disconnected and that's going to be really really annoying because you'll find things that's got like gold w um clip um, but it's ignored the rest of the words that provide context for that. And uh, you're not going to get anything resembling good search results. So if you want to search for specific things, you can put in speech marks. A lot of you will know this already, but a lot of people don't. You can put a specific thing in speech marks. So gold clip in speech marks. And then you can put in capitals next to it. And, and that tells Google you're searching for only pages that have um, gold clip as a, as a one phrase, the two words have to be next to each other, and then and whatever you put next to it. So it, it will only search for the four articles that have those things, which means you get rid of all of the fuss. You can also use not in all capitals. I believe they've replaced that with minus. Minus works more effectively now, um, but you can put minus. And then if you don't want to search for celluloid pens, you can put minus in speech marks celluloid, and it will discount any article that has the word celluloid in that thing um, and it makes it a lot easier to find exactly what it is that you're looking for. I also very much recommend once you've made a search like that so gold clip arrow w um, you don't go looking through all the text searches but you go to images and you scroll on the images page because eventually you'll find a pen that looks like the one you're holding and at that point, you can click through and you can start to really narrow your search down. It's like, OK, so that says it's a cross pen. Great, cool. So then you can be like cross gold clip. And it really narrows the search down until eventually you find the model that you're holding. Usually it's been posted to be identified on a fountain pen forum. <laughs> um, I have had that so many times where I have seen a pen and it's in the Google images and I want it to function. And I, I click the link and um, it is a Oh, I am being provided with a cup of tea. Thank you ever so much. Wonderful.
you'd run out. I had run out, you're right. <laughs> Um, so yeah, often fountain pen forums are, are fonts of knowledge, and I, I would recommend fonts, fonts, fonts of knowledge, and I would um, definitely recommend that those are the places to go. I believe there is one that's just called the Fountain Pen Forum that you can visit, and uh, it's got so much information for identifying pens on there. Um, and that is pretty much everything in like the basics, beginners, intro stuff. I was going to focus primarily on primarily on Parker and Waterman today, because those are the two brands that pretty much everyone knows. They're where beginners to vintage pens tend to go. Sometimes they go Schaefer, sometimes they go Frost, sometimes they go Eversharp, um, maybe Todd, Swan. There's so many brands that were producing pens um, from the early 1900s through to late 1950s, 60s, 70s, um, to provide some brilliant pens. Um, but Parker and Waterman are absolutely the two big ones in the UK that everybody knows if they have been, have any interest in vintage pens. So uh, this is is the lovely part, I believe, um, that we are going to be using a random number generator to announce the prize. It's Steph, are you doing that, or would you like me to do that? I'm happy to. I think we've lost her. United. That's okay. I can do it. We can chat. Um, I don't know. So yeah, our, uh, our our first and big prize this evening is this beautiful Schaefer Targa, which has its white dots there. Um, you know, so you know it's a Schaefer. Eventually, it's all all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares. There we go. I can now say it. <laughs> um, I hope that was helpful to people. I think the, the bigger helpful part is going to be from here on as uh, people actually have questions for me to answer because there's a lot of information that is hard to impart in a talk, but much easier to impart in a conversation. Um, and I can pull out all my bags and boxes of interesting pens and talk about refinishing and refurbishing. And so the pen goes to Ooh. Lucy Rogers. Yay, well done, Lucy. And I will do the ink now. I actually have many questions for you. I waited, but now I'm going to do the random number generator first, and then we can. Very excited to have some questions. Um, but if anyone else wants to ask while I'm doing that, feel free. Oh, lots and lots of, of uh, comments in the chat. Um, oh, yay. Everybody is, is very, very welcome. I'm hoping that everybody enjoyed it and I didn't blather on too much about nonsense. <laughs> um, this is a topic I can talk about for quite literally years. Uh, I have bored the pants of everybody who knows me. Um, different types of Waterman flex snips. That is something that I actually haven't got as much information on as I would like to have. Um, although I know that they did do a fair few varieties on their very, very early hard rubber pens. Um, so they had uh, obviously different sizes and they also offered um, for a very long time, basically untipped nibs because early Waterman Flex nibs were like, they were very early, they were 1800s. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment because I think we've got a random number. Yeah, so the ink actually goes to your friend, Isha. <gasps> Yay, won congrats the rubber Isha. Wonderful. Um, it was number 37, and she was number 37 in my list. So that is very exciting. Um so I'd want to that's... get a sample out of it so you can get it as well. Well, actually, the speakers are getting one, aren't they? So yeah, yeah I think I, you're I, fine. I, I get my speaker bottle because I was going to be giving Isha a sample from my speaker bottle anyway. So there you go. You can get your own one. Um, I believe Roz has a question and has a hand up. Maybe sorry, yes, Roz. Uh, if you want to stop screen sharing here so that we can um, kind yes. of do a gallery view and then we can chat stop for a bit. sharing. There we go. And gallery. Cool. Sorry, Ross. You go. Right. I use the Parker, the Parker pen site to ID Parkers quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and I use Pen Hero for Schaefer's, but I find they're just not as comprehensive. Yeah. And both the Schaefer's have a real habit of having like a triumph nib 
and one of their other their um uh what's the other nib called the and I'll put them in the same model and Material. also like the craftsman and the touchdown seem to overlap a lot is there anywhere that's the equivalent of the parkers which is better than the pen hero so I just find the shapers are a nightmare um, so shapertaga.com has a whole load of really, really good comprehensive information on different um, like colours and models and colourways of specific things. Um... <laughs> oh no, I've just read the chat. <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, shapertaga.com, I think that's right, um, has uh, like every single colorway they ever did of the imperials of the targas of everything it's not just for target fans it's pretty much every shape they've ever done um there's a huge amount of information on there i was able to identify a like little known unusual crossover between sailor and shaper that they did it's called the sentinel there is another shaper model called the sentinel because of course there is they can't be normal um but they did a, a model called the sentinel that was a crossover with um sailor and it's got like a heart shaped aperture on the nib and it's got slight flex and it's beautiful. I've got two in my boxes at the moment that I'm in love with. Um, so I would highly recommend shapertarget.com. Um, Thank you. And uh, yeah, hopefully that will give you more information. I think it was linked in the chat earlier today. Um, if you scroll right up, um, and I've got a few direct to me messages, which I have seen just so those people know that I have seen them. Um, yeah, George linked it um, earlier. Um, it's it's absolutely fantastic for just IDing pretty much anything to do with Shaper. Yeah, found um, it. It's replaced all your microscope labs. <laughs> I have questions. <laughs> um, Thank you so much, Hayes. That was really good. I, I didn't actually put that much thought into looking at pens before. Like, I like flexness in case you, anyone here didn't know. I've been talking about that as far as yours can hear, but um, I didn't actually realize that most of mine are actually Waterman. So the ones that I find that are flex nibs are actually Waterman. Um, I would also, my question was going to be similar to Scribbles. I, I don't know much about what the origination of certain, some of these pens are. I have some Ones I found recently, um, they were actually at the London Pen Show, uh, kind of like an eBay lot. And this guy was just selling them in a basket. And I was like, oh, this, this Netflixes. And I was like, oh, I want this. They needed new sacks, 100%. But I got them in a job lot for about £60. And there were these three in there. They're all Watermans. Oh, they're gorgeous. Um, <gasps> and my favorite one is this one. It's kind of like a brownie, Ooh. orangey type of thing. Um, but I have, I have no clue what they are. Uh, so if you want to have a look, I can take some pictures later. If you can take um, some pictures, yeah. I can almost definitely I do those for you. Um, I, yeah. oh. So they're they're really cool. Um, this one, unfortunately, has a bit of crack in it. But I think, well, it's a stack, right? So it should write. So there shouldn't be any leakage in it. It should just be. Um, it looks like a W5. It does look a lot like a W5, but I think the clip's wrong. Um, I'm just going to like zoom in on your on your um my face i'm gonna i'm gonna make you the spotlight for a moment um <laughs> oh no it does have the w5 clip that pale one um yeah. yeah no i think that might no the the band's wrong it's got two bands around the top of the cap uh the w5 yeah. normally has three um i will take a proper look at that if you can take some photos yeah i will this is the kind of mm. weird knowledge that you get like the number of cap bands to id the pen this is what i'm doing squinting at ebay listings <laughs> in the morning. like why did you take this down the wrong end of a telescope why is it in your like a dark sex dungeon <laughs> like why <laughs> um no but it's been it's been interesting though because i never actually put that much thought into it because i when I find like a job lot or something, I, I've not been brave enough to buy an eBay lot yet, mm -hmm. but I might do one day. And I guess going to the pen show just gave me a bit more confidence because I could physically see them. Even they were broken. The yeah. one, like I said, the green one has a crack in it, but because it's got a sack, no ink should leak, I hope. <laughs> That's what I was yeah. thinking. Um, but the nib is gorgeous. So I can't wait to ink it. And it was sitting in my bag for a couple of weeks now and I've not been motivated to get it. So you've made me go and get it. So I will link them and I'll take a, uh, some photos for you later. 
but it was really good. And the other thing I wanted to say is like with um, pelicans as well, I think I again have quite a few of those, but like you said, there's not much resource available, but I've got some, a couple of unusual ones if you want to see, well, not unusual, but um, I've heard that they're reform. It says that on the side. And there are these ones. Ooh, those are lovely. One yes. is actually Callie's, which I need to send back to her. But it's it's I I've gone and dug them out. I haven't had time, but Beautiful. um, they are piston fillers with a gold nib. And this was another job lot that I bought, and oh, they're not flex, the but they're really good. No, it's a it's a, oh, it's, a um, it's, it's a window. A, it's a window. It's not a sun bleaching. Um, it's window. So both of them have a window. I I love I love finding mm -hmm. these older pens and they've got such unique features like this. You've got like a, a, a tinted window or like an, a weird filling system. Sometimes you've got like yeah. different button fillers. The, the Parker Vacumatics uh, have three different types of button fillers um, and I find them fascinating trying to find out which one's which. Um, and I've just seen Andrew's message in the chat. Get well soon um, and, and do... Do give you you do get yourself lots and lots of rest wrap up nice and warm i've got a blanket around my legs at the moment because it's a little bit cold in here um so do make sure you get lots of um yes. lots of rest um yeah with the the vintage waterman nibs waterman was one of the first companies to produce working house pens. so they um mm. it, it, waterman um did it were doing it in the 1890s and then um no 18 1880s because their um, centennial was um, 1984 so they produced their first fountain pens in 1884-ish um, and they were just like trying to stop a leak in a pen effectively. Um, I, I believe it was Harold Waterman, I've got that definitely wrong, almost definitely, um, but they've um, he was trying to stop a leak in a pen. He was getting really frustrated with his dip pens and having to completely refill them. So he like put ink inside a pen and then it just kept leaking everywhere. He eventually developed his first fountain pen. Um, and the first flex nibs were basically because he was using his dip pen nibs in his pens. And so he kept using that style of nib. I believe they were made by the Warranted Nib Company at that point, but this is stretching my, my memory a little bit. I need to check in my, my books. Um, uh, they were just using dip pen nibs uh, like the ones that you can still get nowadays. Um, if I pop this out of my feather quill from the globe. <laughs> um, <laughs> so like the Lennart ones. Um, and so a lot of early Waterman nib nibs will look a lot like that and will have quite significant flex like these nibs because they just were dip pen nibs up until about 1915. They were just uh, repurposed dip pen nibs. Um, Waterman got big enough that they were they had their own company making them and they were stabbed with the Waterman name fairly early on. Um, you find this with a lot of early fountain pen companies that they had um, like warranted nibs or um, like other other particular nib companies uh, names on because until you got large enough you couldn't manufacture your own in-house but they were all repurposed dip pens effectively or um redesigned dip pens so the reason that there are various different varieties of dip uh, of flex nib is because they were modeled based on different dip pen nibs that people liked um do you want to stop recording Hayes, and then we can just continue yeah talking. i think that's so if probably, everyone has I, any related questions then we can ask and then if not we can record and continue chatting yeah i'm happy with that if anybody else has anything um that they really want to ask um that they want on the recording Speak now or forever hold your peace. Mm -hmm. I think that is fine. Cool. In which case, I'm going to stop the recording now. <laughs>